Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I am Brian. I teach Spanish in Ohio, and I'm glad to be here tonight. I, as Aaron was having you put uh, where what languages you teach and where you're from, I saw that there are some who teach French and German and some other languages. What I'm going to demonstrate tonight is a Spanish reader, but I think it, there are some strategies and techniques and some of the concepts I think will apply to any language and really any work. I'm going to use one soon to be published reader as an example here. But again, even if you don't speak Spanish or don't teach Spanish or you don't use this book or whatever, I think there's a lot of techniques that uh, will apply to other readers. I'm just going to head, go ahead and get going, even though we're a few minutes before 530 if some others show up. No problem. We'll take a couple extra minutes here. Uh, we only have half an hour, which I think is about perfect. Uh, so I want to jump right into it. We are talking about an interactive mystery reader and what I do with that, what I've been doing that with my students. Uh, the, the description was, can, can your class help catch a criminal? We'll use a yet to be published Spanish novel to demonstrate techniques for engaging readers in a mystery thriller. And this is the part I really like. Students will be so lost in the clues and the alibis and the story that they forget they're even reading, which is a goal of a lot of the reading that we do in class. We want it to be so compelling that students don't realize that they're reading because unfortunately not all students like to read. Even some of the good students sometimes will complain a little bit about reading uh, and then we get into it and they find out that a story is actually compelling and they enjoy the process. So that's the goal here is trying to get them so involved in what's going on that they don't even realize they're reading but we as a teacher know that they are gaining very, very valuable exposure and growing their skills. And then as I said, strategies demonstrated here can be applied to other text. So this is the book. It is called Quien Mato a Gustavo, or Who Killed Gustavo? And it is not yet published. It is something that will hopefully be published soon. When it is published, it will and can be a book, just a regular normal book like any other reader that you have, that if you have a classroom library, you put it in your library, or you can read it with a class and just have it in print form as a book. It's, it's just a mystery book like any other book. Um, what I'm going to show you today, what I did with it is kind of split it up. The, the thing about it is that it's a mystery. And the danger of a mystery is that students will flip to the back to find out the answer before you want them to. Now, if it's an individual reader, most students who are reading a book individually, they don't want to spoil the ending. So if you just have it as a book that students are reading, that's great. Or you have very mature readers, or maybe you make sure that they don't go ahead too fast. That's great. Uh, but what I'll show you today is what I've done. And one of the things I hope for when we publish it is that we make an, uh, an ebook version of it that you could actually split up and give them the first 15 chapters. You do all that we'll go over here tonight with that. And then you could read the last couple chapters. When I did this book recently with my students, this is what I did. I printed it out. Now, I, I wrote the book so I can print it out. I don't recommend printing out books if you don't have permission. But I printed out a reader. And it's new, too, so I didn't have a, a print copy of the book. I printed out the reader. And this is, this is the first 15 chapters. It's not the end. This is the end. This last couple pages is the end. Students didn't have this until we got to that point uh, in the story. So we used this. Now, uh, I'll show you in a minute. We didn't actually even start using this until a few chapters in because the beginning is so simple, we were able to read it projected on a screen. Uh, now, how and, and why a murder mystery, how we got to this. I always did this unit in my level three classes that was like a murder mystery unit. And it was very interactive where the students came up with details about uh, the people that were at this party when somebody got killed and, and they came up with all these details and then I would put it together uh, into some kind of reading at the end. And it was good, but I do other units that are like that still. And I wanted something that where I could direct a little bit more of what language I wanted them to see. I could create more details of the story. So I decided to put it together into a book. It's still interactive, but there's just it just allowed me to push some things a little bit more that I wanted students to see and gain more exposure to the language. And then a murder mystery because it's compelling. As I said, one, one of our goals always for reading is that we want compelling text. And, and with a mystery, there's suspense, there's you know, wondering what's going to happen. Do I know what's going to happen next? And so that creates some compelling uh, interest in the story. Whenever we do reading, I talk about this a lot. 
compelling text. We want compelling text. We want comprehensible text. We want to vary our delivery. We'll get into this a little bit tonight. I do have other videos and things that I've written and, and sessions that I've done. If you're interested in more information about, you know, maybe how we use pre-reading strategies to make a text comprehensible or how we can vary delivery, let me know. I can point you in the direction of some more resources for that. But briefly, we'll get into each of these a little bit tonight. Um, again, hopefully the text is compelling because it's a mystery and there's some humor and some fun in it. I'll show you a little bit about what I did to make it comprehensible and then a little bit about how we varied how we were reading it. So for my class, I did this early in the year in level three. I would say it fits very well in a level two class, maybe a late level one. It was pretty easy for my students. Uh, it's all just a matter of how much scaffolding you want to do with the book. For me, throughout the entire book, there were a few phrases and structures that I really wanted to emphasize. When we do reading, I and again, this is something I have in other videos, but I talk a lot about there's different types of new vocabulary in a reading. There's some new vocabulary that students, it just needs to be defined so students can read and understand, and then that's fine. There's other new vocabulary and grammar that we really want students to internalize and be able to use afterwards. And so these are some of the things that we focused on in this book. And, and since doing it in class, they really, they have internalized this language and use it very well now. The first one is this phrase, alguien lo mató, someone killed him. And matar, kill, is a little bit violent, but it's a word, it's a vocabulary term that as my students move on into upper levels and into AP, it's, it's a concept they need to know. This idea of direct object pronouns with the lo mató uh, is great. We got great practice of that. And then the word alguien uh, is a very, very powerful word that has been great now in discussions in class that we can use that because they've really internalized it well. The verb cuidar, to take care of, becomes very significant in the story. It was just something that that worked really well that they were able to, to really get a better grasp of. Te lo juro. As we go through, as we look at the story, uh, there are suspects in this murder and almost every one of them at some point says, Te lo juro, I swear to you, I swear I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I swear to you. So we got lots of reps of that phrase, which has been very good to use going forward in class. Uh, Odio, I hate, same idea, something that came up a lot in the book and we were able to use a lot. And then this idea of que estabas haciendo, what were you doing? This story is in the present tense because it's an investigation. However, it's good because there's a good mix of present and past because during this investigation there are lots of questions of what were you doing what were you doing yes or earlier today when this happened and so for my students that was a review of something we had seen before but even if it's not it's pretty easy for students to get the idea of that especially if they've seen the present of like what are you doing and just to get them to understand that that's what this question is asking, and that's what these people are talking about, what they were doing. Um, it, there's a lot of that in the book, and we got a lot of good practice with it. Okay, so we started this story, and again, for chapter one and two, I, they did not have the text yet. It's in the, it's in the printout, so if somebody wasn't in the class, they had it here for later. But chapter one was, the chapter one is like one page on here. And, yeah, one page. And so we did it projected. It allowed me to put some pictures in um, and make it keep it very simple. So I, and I'm not going to read all this, but just kind of summarize. This is what chapter one looked like. San Pepe Nio is a small town in Spain. In the town, there's a school. In the school, there's a teacher named Springle, and there are 10 students in her class. Adan, Beatriz, Carlos, Diana, Edwin, Francisco, Graciela, Hector, Isabel and ah, Jimena. And if you probably noticed, one thing that helps me is that it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So we have this class. We have these 10 students. That's all we know so far. Also in the class, there is a class pet and he's a hamster and his name is Gustavo. And yes, when we get to this point, there's a lot of awe because they know that the title of the book is Who Killed Gustavo? And now we know that Gustavo was the hamster and yeah, he's not going to make it. He's the best friend of the teacher. Uh, he is a dancing hamster. Every time she puts on Alvaro Soler is a Spanish artist that we listen to a lot in class. Uh, 
this may get changed in the final version, but this for our class was a, something they would know. Anytime she puts on a song from him, the hamster dances, and they all love that he dances to the music every time she puts on that song. This girl is Graciela. She is the one who takes care of the hamster. That's going to be important later on. And that's the end of chapter one. So that we have this class and these 10 students. Chapter two is also very simple. There's a detective. His name is Pepe Pistas. He's the best detective in this town because he's the only detective. And one day he gets a call from the teacher, Mrs. Pringle. And she says, Gustavo is dead. And I think somebody killed him. And Pepe Pistas gets excited. He wants to investigate a murder. And he said, oh, Gustavo, is that your husband? Is that a friend? Is that a neighbor? And she says, no, that's our class hamster. And he's a little less excited to find out that it's a hamster that was killed. But he's going to help out. He puts on his jacket and his hat. He leaves his office to go investigate the murder of a hamster. So we read those two chapters online or on the projected on the screen. Uh, we go into chapter three which I think they did read in the uh, printout version. Again, very simple. Basically in chapter three, this guy Pepe Pistas is going to the school and he investigates a little bit. He finds, uh, he looks at the hamster. He, hamster, he says the time of death was 1224 in the afternoon. And now I need to do interviews with all of the students. Everybody is a suspect. So that's where we really get rolling with the interactive part of this book. Chapter four through 13 each one is an interview with another with one of the students in the class and there's questioning about what they were doing and the students start to get involved in keeping track of what everybody was doing what their motives were and um, who they think killed poor gustavo after chapter three after this beginning we can do some questioning uh about what happened, who's doing these interviews, how many suspects are there. And then we get ready to roll into these chapters with the suspects. Now, when we do this, every student gets this paper and you can see it there. In fact, I can open it here, I think. And it's basically their follow sheet that they're going to use throughout the entire process of looking at these suspects in the class and trying to figure out who killed the hamster. We talk, we do this kind of together. Uh, we talk about what happened, the detective, where did it happen and so on. And then as we read about every suspect in the class, we put down information. We rewrite their name, characteristics. Is it somebody that's athletic? Is it somebody who is rich? Is it somebody who likes photography? Whatever characteristics we can come up with in Spanish. And then we draw what each person was doing at 1224 because that's the time that was established as the time that the hamster died so we do some draw they have to draw here not write but we draw what each person was doing and then we write down potential motives that that student would have for killing the hamster and for pretty much every student there's something that looks like it could be a motive so as we did it we did about two or three each day you could do one student per day. I, I didn't want it to drag that much. You could do a lot in a day. I, you always want to find that balance between reading too much and getting a little bored or exhausted, but reading enough to get good input for the day. So we went through the students and we did two or three every day and we read different ways. Sometimes we read individually, sometimes we read together. I'll show you. I did a, a video for a couple chapters where they, um, excuse me, watched the video. And we start to meet all these characters and they interview these characters. The first boy, Adan, is very worried because his math test got canceled because of this hamster. Oh, they did a funeral for the hamster and it was this big mess and he's worried. And with each one of the students, the detective says, he kind of uh, accuses them. And so he says, I think you did. I think you killed this hamster because he was a distraction in class. And he says, no, 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 I didn't do it. I swear I didn't kill the hamster. And the next girl is Beatrice, and she's distracted by her cell phone. And he says, I think you wanted attention, and the hamster got all this attention, so you killed him for the attention. She says, no, 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 I didn't do it. Carlos likes video games. His favorite video game is Fortnite. Uh, but, uh, and he says, well, that's a violent video game. That must mean you killed him to get, because you play violent video games. No, 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 I swear I didn't do it. Diana played her, her clarinet for the funeral 
And so he says, I think you killed him because you wanted to show off that you could play this song on your phone. By the way, I did use AI images for these, uh, for doing it in class. That won't be the final images. We all laughed at what AI thought a clarinet should look like. Uh, these one, And if we have time, I'll show you the actual video, but I did some Ed Puzzle. The next one was this guy named Edwin, and he was buying gifts for his girlfriend. And we find out his parents are really rich, and he bought all these incredible gifts for his girlfriend. And then Francisco was taking pictures at the time of the death. And they look at the camera and there's some interesting things on the camera. And Graciela is the girl who takes care of the hamster. So she's crying in her interview because she's so sad that poor Gustavo is dead. And there's lots of details as we go through each one of these. Hector is a, uh, he's wearing like a Metallica shirt and listening to rock music and he hates pop music. So Maybe he killed him because he was so sick of the listening to the pop songs that the hamster danced to. Isabel shows up and she's got paint all over her and she's very quiet and she likes to draw and she draws pictures of her cats because cats are easier to talk to than people. And maybe she killed him because she wanted to give it to her cat, whatever. And then we get to this last one, Jimena. And Jimena is, we find out from some of the other students that she is new she's got this history of violence she's been kicked out of other schools everybody thinks that she's the one who did it they all say we think Jimena did it Jimena did it Jimena did it and so we get to this chapter about her and she says yeah I did it I killed the hamster you should expel me and the detective says no you didn't do it I know who did it and it wasn't you and then we get to this chapter 15 where he says all right Everybody sit down. I'm going to explain to you who did it. I know who did it. And it wasn't Jimena. And so that is where in class we stopped. So at that point in class, we've filled in this information for every student. We have characteristics. We've drawn what they were doing at that time. We have some possible motives for why they may have killed the hamster. And then we stop. And then at that point, we did a quiz. And I told them on this quiz that they could use this sorry they could use this paper that we've been working on so they have their drawings only drawings here they have some other things written down and then they do this quiz and there's it's pretty simple there's a lot of questions about what people were doing there's simple questions about what's gone on in the story how many suspects are there what were these people doing who played their clarinet uh there's some translation with some vocabulary in there questions about evidence, so on, so on, so on. And then the last thing on this quiz I asked them is, in your opinion, who killed Gustavo and why? And if you're right, if it's correct, you can win some extra credit points and candy. And so the students all, at this point, they haven't seen the end and they put their guess for who killed Gustavo. And there were some really, really good answers. I think only two or three students got it right. But there were some really creative answers written very well in Spanish, you know, so, um, that the Graciela killed him because she was sick of cleaning the cage or the detective killed him because he wanted a, a high profile case or whatever. And so then after that, I, we, you know, give that quiz back to them. And then we read the end. We read the ending. And again, for the ending, I give them another printout. It's just the last couple chapters. And we read the end together. It's important to do that ending together all at one point because otherwise people are going to read it anyway. And so we read the ending and let's see, should I tell you the ending? All right, I'll give it away a little bit. But uh, basically the, the guy who took the pictures, they look at all the pictures that he took and they find out that he was taking pictures of the girl who was the girlfriend of the other boy. He was in love with this girl. He was taking all these pictures. He planned to kill the hamster and pin it on her boyfriend and bring in another hamster. It sounds more complicated than it really is. And so we find out that this guy, Francisco, was the one who really killed the hamster. And they come to take him away. And as they're taking him away, the girl says, wait, what's going to happen to him? And they say, well, he's going to be suspended for a few weeks. And she says, I will wait for you. I'll be here. I love you. Thank you so much. And her boyfriend says, what? Why? Why would he kill a hamster? And she said, well, he did it for love and he did it for me. And um, 
you know, you've never done anything like that for me. And so she's in love with this guy who killed a hamster. And so the, the students all kind of laugh. Those who got it right, get some rewards for getting it right for what they guessed. So again, the idea is that we are so stuck in this story. We're, we're paying attention to our uh, following along, our questions that we're answering, what we're drawing, our motives, trying to figure out what happened, that we forget that we're actually reading and growing our skills. And really the skills did grow with a lot of that vocabulary and with a lot of their just language skills. Um, after reading, there are some potential, some possible extensions. Now, because this is a, a story based heavily on investigation, there's some parts that can be acted out, but there's a lot of dialogue. And that's one of the really the values in something like this is it's, a, it's exposure to a lot of dialogue, questions, answers, questions, answers. There are some parts you can act out and record. There are also sections where you can translate. I don't do a lot of translating with reading in class, but there are some short sections in here where one person can be the detective, one person can be one of the kids, one of the suspects, and you can translate their conversations. We did a lot of drawing. There's potential for some more drawing, illustrating each chapter. Again, it's not a long book, but it's broken up into 17 different chapters. So it's cut up into sections where students can do some drawing or illustrating or digital illustrations. Uh, what happens next? You can do some writing or acting out about what might happen next with these two the, that are in love. Each character, we've learned a lot about each character. And now we can talk about what would those characters do in other settings? You know, we, now that we know each one, what would they do in some other settings? Um, so lots of potential to go on. And as there is with any book, there's a potential to extend it a little bit afterwards. Now, as far as applications for other texts, just some of these things that we've been looking at here with how to do vocabulary, how to work things together as a class. But this idea of this paper of looking at characters and what they do and even motivations is something that you can do with other readers because you can look at characteristics, you can look at actions that characters do, and you can look at motives or motivations. You know, why do characters do what they do? In a mystery like this, it works out really well because it's just super clear about all 10 of these characters. But that's something that you can apply to other books as well is taking a good look at characters and, and guessing what's going to happen next. Let me show you very quickly one more thing. And that is, I mentioned that, you know, we use a variety of ways to read. And one of the things we did for chapters, I think eight through 10 was a video. And I do this sometimes with class. I think I actually did this on a day I was out of school, but it doesn't have to be. And one of the ways we sometimes vary reading is intelligent. Sorry, is that we can do the reading on a video. De está preocupado por su examen de matemática. El siguiente es Edwin. Usa un suéter rojo con una. So you can talk, you can show images, you can show, um, read the text, have it, you could have without them seeing the text where they're just listening or with the text in front of them where they're actually reading as you talk. Regalarle un abrigo de p uh, you can include questions in there. So this is not super different because they're seeing the text, but that little variation sometimes will help engage and decrease the monotony of the reading process. Da la camera. And there's with, with videos, you can include more images, you can include translations, you can point to things. Um, so that's what we did for chapter eight through 10. Now, as they did that, they still continued with this paper where they were drawing and filling in the information about the uh, suspects. Okay, um, I will here have some time here for questions if you have some specific questions. Um, before we get to that though, if you are interested, so this is something that we're looking at publishing and, and sharing. If you are interested in trying this out, with a class or individual student readers, let me know. I'm super interested in teachers who want to try it with a class. If you have a class, you think it would work, try it. 
um, see how it goes, some feedback, things like that. Or maybe you have some readers who read a lot. Uh, you have some students who are readers and they read a lot of readers in class and you know you, you can really trust their judgment and you have someone like that who might be interested. Either way, if you're interested in something like that, contact me, let me know. Um, I can get you some materials and talk a little bit about uh, that, having you try it out. And uh, yeah, we can talk details about that. So if that's something you're interested, there's an email there for me. These slides will be shared at the end or however you want to get a hold of me. Uh, that may be an option to have some people try it out. Also, I, if you weren't here at the beginning, I know some people just joined us late. This will be, I know I just showed how to use it interactively with a class and kind of go through some things together. It will also be available as a book that could be part of your library that students can grab and read. Um, also check out my website, it has lots of books available for Spanish. Coming up soon, also I have a book that's gonna be published that is not a reader for students, but rather a guide for teachers uh, about world language classes and increasing increasing enrollment in world language classes. And it's really just a collection of a lot of these workshops and things and how we use classroom culture and community and a lot about comprehensible input and how we use CI to foster communication is how all of those things put together lead to these classes that students wanna be a part of. And how for years and years and years, we've been trying to convince students to take languages when instead maybe we should really focus on creating these classes that they want to be a part of, and then they continue. So that is finished. It's ready to be published. It's coming out soon. So keep an eye on uh, Voces Digital. They'll let you know when it's ready. I'll let you know when it's ready, but that's coming up in the near future. If you have questions about that, you can let me know as well. Okay. So we want to respect time. We got about 552 right now. Um, I have not been looking at the chat but I don't know if there are questions in the chat or if somebody wants to ask a question, I would be glad to answer. Um, yes, Brian, there was a question about your Ed puzzle. Mm -hmm. An activity that you had um, on Ed puzzle. Okay, I just lost the chat. Um, Let me see. It says, do you mind sharing how you created your Ed puzzle where you read and showed yes. your reading? Did good you question. use iMovie or QuickTime both? Yes, good question. So I use, I make, a, I make a lot of screencasts. I use a program that is called ScreenPal. Uh, it used to be called Screencast-O-Matic. It's called ScreenPal. There are quite a few software, uh, programs to do it. Screencastify, ScreenPal, any program that makes a screencast allows you to record your voice and record what's on the screen. Um, and a lot of them are free. So I make that video where I create slides just like we have here. And then I open up that program and I record myself going through the slides and I can put a picture of myself if I want them to see me or if I just want them to see the slide, those are all settings. I make that video. I save it, I upload that video to Edpuzzle, and then you can create the activities there very easily. If you have more like detailed questions about that, uh, let me know, I'd be glad to show you. But yeah, that works out really well for me to make screencasts and share them. And I don't, it doesn't have to be Edpuzzle, you can just share videos with your class that are not on other platforms. Stop that for a second, okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah, there is another question that talks about as, uh, the age group. What age group did, did you do this book and lessons with? Yeah, so I did this book with my level three students, which are a lot of 10th graders. Um, yeah, 10th grade in their third year, some stronger than others. Um, you know, and I understand if you're teaching, I did see some of you were middle school, four through eight. Um, the idea of a murder mystery maybe doesn't work at that age. And that's, that's fine. This is maybe a concept you can use with other stories. Um, yeah. Um, then it's where would we be able to find more information about the pre-reading activities? More information about the pre-reading activities at my website, briancandle.com. There are videos 
And if that is not enough, send me an email, contact me on there and I'll send you some other videos. But I think there are videos linked right on there on briancandle.com with there's, a, there's two or three that are focused only on reading and they talk a lot about reading. I just shared the website again. Um, could you, oh yeah, the website, uh, Aaron sure. posted. Um, yes, Screen Pal is right. That Leanne said Screen Pal is correct. Just so you know, with Screen, Screen Pal, I do have a paid subscription. It's not, it's like $15 a year. I do that because it allows you to record audio and gives you some special settings, but there are a lot of free versions that you can make very good screencasts with. Let's see, what was I Any other questions? Um, there is another one by Claudia. Would you mind sharing how you created the images that you included on your slides? <laughs> yeah, so um, the image that I created for the stories um, was just an, uh, an AI illustrator. I don't remember what it was called. Um, but there are lots of illustrators where you, you write a description and it creates an image for it. Um, and my daughter does illustration for Vose since she was severely offended by my AI images. <laughs> and I told her. She also plays the clarinet. She plays the clarinet. So she was doubly offended by the way that clarinet looked and the fact that it was AI. And I told her that's not that's not how it will end up. There will be real illustrations. Mid journey. Yeah, that's a good one for AI. I think mid journey is one that's used a lot. Um, yeah. And the students laughed. Did they know those were they were AI created and they we laughed and that was part of the fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm like, I had already seen that book um, and now I'm even more intrigued. So I can't wait to work with you on it more. So yeah, I think we'll be publishing it soon. <laughs> and I could definitely see how it like just gets students hooked and like, you know, all the different characters and like everything that you can do from those characters. So it was just very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, some kids got really, really into like too into it. But it was <laughs> it was fun. That's the best thing though. Yeah, That's right. A great story. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, thank you so much, Brian. Sorry, Lorraine. I think Lorena, did you just post this the um slides on there? Yeah, those slides are available. That has yeah. the links and things if you need to contact me. Uh, I'm glad to help. I know this was quick, so I'd be glad to share details or point you towards anything else, other resources. So thank you so much for your attention and Enjoy the rest of this great, short, but great conference. Thank you so much, Brian. It was a real pleasure to listen to your presentation. So many ideas that we can also incorporate for our classes, which I really enjoyed listening to. So 